Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on the Family Constitution, a Foundation for Family Alignment. Uh, before we get started with today's discussion, here are a, a little bit of housekeeping items. I want to make sure that you're comfortable with the interface that you'll be using today. Um, you are able to open and close your control panel using the uh, orange arrow on your screen. Um, you'll want to choose your audio settings. Uh, most of you probably uh, connected by your computer by default, but if there is, uh, if you want to change that, you can do so for sure. I have a little bit of an echo. Um, the recording of the presentation will be available within 48 hours. And, uh, and you will uh, receive instructions on how to, to access, access that, that by email. Uh, by I'll email. About 48 hours. Be sure to leave a little, bit, leave a little bit of time to receive that uh, and get those instructions. And if you don't, you can certainly reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you with that. At the end of today's program, you'll also be asked to complete a brief survey about your experience today. Uh, we greatly appreciate your feedback. We use that in helping us to plan future programs. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our discussion panel today. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Chris Eckrich. Uh, Chris is a senior advisor of the Family Business Consulting Group. Chris's work is focused on building leadership excellence and maintaining family unity in enterprising families. Chris's work frequently involves leading families through developing agreements and policies, as well as constitutions when appropriate. Chris is also co-author of two family business books, The Family Council Handbook, and working for a family business, a non-family employee's guide to success. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Christy, and welcome, everybody. And our other presenter today is Dana Telford. Dana is a principal consultant of the Family Business Consulting Group. Dana's work with families on succession and family alignment spans industries as well as geography. Dana's work with families on six continents, has guided families in various cultures and stages of complexity in contemplating a family constitution as a tool for alignment. Dana is a frequent lecturer on a variety of business, family business topics, including building trust-based partnerships in family enterprise systems. Thank you for participating today, Dana. Thanks, Christy. One more thing before we get started, a couple notes about our presentation today. So we value confidentiality and uh, aim to protect the privacy of families with which we work through our presentation. So anything that we talk about today, either we've been given permission to share it uh, by the family in question or they are uh, sanitized amalgams of client experiences. And the other thing worth considering is that this is really an educational dialogue. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is practices that families often use in creating constitutions, but not everything is going to be right for an individual family, and it will differ on uh, the family's culture, history, dynamics. And so if you have any questions about what would be right for your family, you should think about uh, your own context and possibly uh, seek advice from your own advisors on your personal situation. So with that, uh, Chris is going to kick us off today in our agenda. Great. So just take a quick review of what we'll be talking about today. Um, we're going to start by exploring why families choose to create a constitution and how families create constitution that's valuable to, the, uh, to their families and, and useful for them. We'll also talk about different processes that families use when they're creating a constitution. There are different ways to approach doing so and we'll address uh, some of those ways today. We'll look at who should be involved in the process in order to get it right. Uh, how to make it stick. If it's going to be a family constitution for a, a broader family, really give some thought to who would participate in the creation of that constitution. We'll explore uh, the types of agreements and policies that are typically included, and then really go over some tips on uh, creating and implementing a constitution. Uh, uh, so many times uh, documents get created and then they end up uh, hidden in a file cabinet somewhere and that's really not the goal of a family constitution. It, it should be a living document. We'll explore different ways that uh, families implement their constitutions. So we're going to start though, we have uh, guests uh, from all over the world today, uh, literally, and uh, we know that some of our guests might have very sophisticated uh, governance taking place in their families, and others might be just at the beginning stages of that. So just very quickly wanted to look at the whole concept of family governance, because that's really where the Constitution has meaning, is in the context of family governance. So 
What is family governance? Family governance is a way to educate and facilitate communication between family members and to provide a forum for constructive discussion, problem solving, and decisions about the family as it relates to the business as well as how the business relates to the family. And if you go to the next slide, uh, Christy, the, when we think about family governance, it's going to look very different from family to family really based on uh, the, how the, what, what the family's composition is. So in early stage family governance, there are going to be fewer owners. You know, if, we, if on the slide you're looking at over to the left side, you know, the founder uh, creates a business and has some children, and those children suddenly start becoming of young, age, young adult age and then into adult age. And during those times, family governance may be sitting around a table. It might be uh, periodic meetings in a, in a hotel room to talk about aspects of the business. You know, at that stage, you're probably talking about, um, you know, what the business means to the family. You might be talking about, uh, you know, family employment opportunities, those kinds of things. Um, and, and the family's going to need a pretty informal governance structure. Frankly, decision making at that stage is quite easy. Usually it's the founder's way or the highway. And, uh, but as the kids get older, maybe the founder's taking input. And then with that input is helping make decisions about how to proceed forward. As we move to the right side of this screen here, over to the late sibling and cousin phase, uh, we have typically as the family's growing, we have more owners, multiple generations involved. And we've seen clients with you know two, three, and, and or four generations simultaneously involved. And the owner and manager roles where they were unified in that early stage governance become more separate in the later stage governance. You have fewer people who are uh, managers and, and maybe a broader group that's an ownership group at that stage. And decision making, therefore, is becoming much more complex. So we want to make sure that that the uh, family is having important dialogue about how they're going to do things uh, as they try to govern themselves in that process. Dana, uh, could you talk a little bit about how the Constitution fits in that context yeah. of family governance then? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, so Chris gave us a, a terrific framework there of family governance and kind of showing us uh, with that framework that families in their business systems change and have different dynamics depending on the stage of the business and how many people are involved. So a constitution is really designed more than anything just to be helpful in making sense of all those dynamics and keeping the group uh, coordinated around common goals. To be real specific with this definition, a constitution is a family agreement, it might be called a charter by the way, some of our international listeners and attendees might, might uh, refer to it as a charter, but it's any kind of written principles and or rules that regulate the relationship of the family with, with its business. And it also, by many of our clients, can be, it is used as that living record of, of the values and the principles and the processes and decisions that are generated by an enterprising family. Sometimes it might include records, shareholders agreements, strategic documents, notes from meetings. So it becomes that place where we can find information, almost like a bank account where uh, if we're looking for financial information, we know where to go to get information about our day-to-day -day, uh, financial information. Constitution can serve that purpose. Um, so it begs the question, you know, why create one? Uh, with the And it's important here to think about what's really going on in these family business systems. I'm a part of a family business system. Uh, you know, many of you are or you might be teaching and educating family uh, family business systems. As Chris said, they start out pretty simple, where a founder uh, has his or her idea about the world and how things should be. And over time, as that founder generates success in business and then has children, um, he or she wants to pass things to the next generation, whether that's ideas about the world. Um, and those kids, become adults and have kids, and this, this is a great representation in this slide of how quickly a small family becomes a large family. And a big question is, 
how is the business progressing as the family dynamics are changing? And how are those two interreact, inter, interrelating with each other? You know, over the last 20 plus years at the Family Business Consulting Group, we've had the opportunity to serve literally thousands of families around the world. And, and we often help them develop these types of living documents, these constitutions that, that help them redefine a purpose in many cases, right? As an analogy, you know, if, if, if my dad uh, had a family business, and let's, let's make the analogy that that business is like a jet that he owns. Well, he can, maybe he's the pilot of that jet if he's got the talent to do it, and he decides where it goes, and he decides when it goes, and he decides um, really what the purpose of, of that is. If my brother and I inherit that jet, um, and we both get into it, and at the same time start arguing about where it's going, and I want to go to Miami, my brother might want to go to Toronto, we have a problem. And so being able to define together, you know, what is the purpose, why are we in business together, uh, is really important. Uh, uh, I'm a partner in the Family Business Consulting Group. I'm also a partner in a family uh, real estate company. And over my career, I realized I didn't make a conscious choice to be a member of my family business. It was not something that I chose to do, is to enter into a business and ownership relationship with my siblings and my mom. And, and we're working on making that more like a partnership of choice. But a constitution gives those who inherit, in most cases, a family business, the chance to redefine the purpose and to say, why are we doing this? We're partners by choice, not just chance. We, we create strategies, and in a constitution, we're able to define those strategies, define the goal, define the purpose, define roles and responsibilities, and start focusing uh, forward on, on growth and the things that are important to us. So to the next slide, what, what can family constitutions do? What's the practical application? How can they be helpful? Well, they can help families that, again, are, are often uh, put into business relationships uh, by, by chance, by birth or marriage, gives them the chance to develop an appropriate decision-making structure beyond the founder, to say, okay, we, we are business partners. We have decisions to make. How are we going to make those decisions? Uh, it helps a family to proactively start to anticipate challenges. One of the things we teach often is to our clients to think about problems as either family-related problems, business-related problems, or ownership-related problems. And by starting to define each of those organizations in a constitution and saying, here's a family issue, here's a business issue, here's an ownership issue, helps to be able to see them coming and start to really create the best options for solving those problems creates a platform for multiple voices. So, so families have hierarchies, ownership groups have hierarchies, and being able to develop good governance as captured by a constitution helps make sure that each person has a voice and that it's appropriate um, with information gathering and decision making. Uh, and and th that next point is so important, creating solutions as challenges arise. You know, I had a client once at a, at a, in a group meeting say, you know, in our family, together, or alone we are weak, he said. Alone we are weak, but together we're really confused. And, and he, he, he used the family constitution in their family to start to create more order in, in being able to develop practical, relevant solutions for the big challenges that they had. Because let's face it, these are very emotional uh, systems that we're involved in. They're hard. And, and so having something like this to help us uh, is certainly beneficial. Also, finally, it, it can help appeal a constitution and the, and the process of creating one appeals to what we would call the artists as well as the engineers. If we think about just human nature, we are all so different. We look at things so differently. We have our own strengths and our own weaknesses. And as families grow and people marry in and people are born, there are artists, people who want to feel as though a process is fair and inclusive and appropriate. And then there are engineers on the other end of that spectrum who act, have to see a deliverable. They need to know when it's going to happen. They need to know how it's uh, 
applicable. So that's one thing that a, a constitution uh, can really help with. Chris, why don't I turn it back over to you? Sure. Thanks, Dana. So, you know, as we think about starting the creation of a constitution, you know, a group, somebody in the family is a champion and has said, hey, this is something we may wish to do in our family. Let's explore it and discussions start. Um, you know, it's easy just to go to a seminar and somebody, you know, you go to a webinar like this and, uh, you know, you heard it on constitutions and say, yes, let's go do a constitution ourselves. Well, you know, that's great, but we really want to be clear on why we're doing it. And a family that comes together on the front end and agrees what is our long-term goal and our long-term vision for having a constitution? What do we want it to do for us? And get some of those objective dreams and hopes out on the table on the front end to make sure that we're going into a process that is actually of value to the to the broader group. The other thing is, you know, we want to start with a commitment to continuity. If, if, if I've had folks before say, you know, we really want to work on all these policies and I talk to the, ownership, the senior generation ownership group and what they're really wanting to do is exit the business and sell it to an external uh, buyer. Well, that's not that's not bringing the family together. Uh, in fact, it's very misleading. So if there's not at least a, a, a curiosity to explore deeply how continuity might take place, a constitution is probably not the right tool for the family. The other thing is, uh, if the family is experiencing significant destructive conflict, uh, all families, by the way, experience conflict. It's just the way it works. And, and frankly, most business organizations have a good, healthy dose of conflict as well, hopefully over strategic issues and, and really important matters. But the Constitution is not the solution for really destructive conflict. If, if a family, if any of our listeners here, if your family is experiencing very destructive conflict where people are cutting each other off and, and refusing to speak together, those issues are going to need to be resolved uh, either prior to or a plan made for working on those things along the way in the Constitution. So the Constitution is not a solution for, you know, really difficult uh, family conflict that's taking place. The other aspect is if we're going to start with to create a Constitution, we want everybody who's going to be uh, bound by it to understand what the process is on the front end. How are we going to do this? I'm going to talk more about process in a minute, but we want to have clarity around here's the process, here's going to, who's going to participate and so forth before we start jumping into creating documents. Um, Dana talked about, you know, having all voices heard or having multiple generations heard and multiple stakeholders heard. And when we think about a constitution creation process, we want a flat hierarchy where even though we know the senior generation maybe controls the uh, the voting power of the of the uh, organization, but as we think about creating something that's going to apply apply to the family, we want to create opportunities for input at all different levels of the family. So we're going to have multiple people included in that process. And um, I, I recently uh, experienced a discussion with a family where the senior generation had uh, essentially created the policies that they wanted everyone else to live by and, and, and were confused as to why they weren't accepted and you know there really wasn't buy-in so as we think about creating a constitution we're going to lean towards inclusion versus control. Uh, a controlling owner could institute policies and just and, and sort of lay them out there and uh, that might last as long as they're in control but in terms of generational continuity that is probably not going to be lasting once that owner is removed from the picture, either through, uh, you know, e e exiting voluntarily or exiting non-voluntarily. So those are just some thoughts as we start the constitution creation process. If we could go to the next page. Uh, I, I look at different ways that we've seen families develop these. And, you know, I think of the more informal process that, that many families use. Maybe they've uh, become educated about, the need for certain types of policies and sort of pick one off at a time and then pick another one off a year later or two years later and eventually start having a set of, of 
policies, maybe a clear mission statement, vision statement, value statement for their family and for the business, frankly, and, and put those together in more informal way. There's nothing wrong with that, um, but it is, it is something that would take a lot of time. Uh, for some families, there's no way they're wanting to take on the, the monumental task of putting together all of the agreements all at one time. And so they're, they're thinking, no, let's start small, build our skill, build our, build our capacity, and do this over time. Um, we like to see a more formal process on a, a, a more regular basis, we think is really effective. Uh, in a formal process, what I mean by that is we state up front, we're going to start on this day, and we're going to work at this pace, and we're going to finish the Constitution, you know, 36 months later or 24 months later or whatever it is. And we lay out goals along the way and understand here's what we're going to do in each segment. And the goal is to complete the Constitution really from start to finish, maybe incorporating some of the documents that are already there, but filling it out completely and ultimately ratifying it and having the group that it will be that will be uh, uh, supporting and in, in, in uh, the group that will bind itself to that Constitution uh, sign off and ratify it. And that's the goal of a more formal process. Um, very specific, time limited, and uh, the family can see progress being made very quickly, whereas sometimes that more informal process, people get frustrated and they wonder, you know, why are we doing this policy creation and so forth? It just seems to drag on. So I don't know, Dana, if you had any other thoughts on that, but uh, well, one, one point again, back to the the fact that we've got a number of international participants here. Uh, there are some countries that that I've worked in uh, over the years where um, country legislation has made the ratification of a family constitution, or at least certain parts of it, legal, like legal and binding. And so, one thing I would suggest to you. Uh, international uh, attendees is to find out right what kind of legislation is out there is it legal is it a legal binding document if your constitution has been ratified I think that's it's an interesting part of um, of, uh, of legislation going on um, I'll should I take it off take it from you here Chris yeah, and go on it. okay so uh, I, I Preparing for this webinar, I, I kind of walked back in time to the very first client that I ever had in New York City. Uh, There's a, a family uh, involved in a lot of things, but they had a, a, a jewelry business. And part of what I was doing was to work on creating some strategic initiatives for them. And I went to, to meet with an analyst who uh, followed jewelry, uh, ju the jewelry industry. So I sat down with him as, as a kind of a fresh out of business school young kid and before he let me say anything he said tell me first who are you, uh, what's important to you, uh, and why, and what are you trying to accomplish. And it just blew me away. I mean, it was such a great set of questions and I really stumbled through it and I, and, and I said why do you ask those questions and he said look we all have so much time and energy in every, in every day and I don't want to spend time with people who don't know what they're doing and what they're focused on and what their goal is. And, and it, it really stuck with me and, and it's a very applicable question to ownership groups that get to a scenario of, of inheritance or even of purchase where they become owners again by choice. Um, and if they have been born or married into a family and they don't feel as though they have been able to choose, this opportunity now with these critical questions at the start of a family constitution gives you the chance to say, we're doing this by choice. And it starts with these simple but difficult and most important questions. Who are we? Right? I mean, are we, are we a family of, of, uh, Engineers, are we a family of philanthropists? Are, are, and, and even down to literally, when we talk about family, who are we talking about? The direct descendants of a particular couple? Are we talking about spouses? Are we talking about adopted children, stepchildren, life partners, right? So first starting with a very clear idea of for whom we are developing this constitution. And then 
to say what's important to us. Okay, we acknowledging the fact that there are many people, many voices, lots of experience, different strengths, different weaknesses, to reach alignment around this question of what are the principles that we're going to follow going forward. Um, you know, why are we choosing to put time and energy into this enterprise? It, 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 in the second and third and fourth generation, it's no longer okay to just say, well, it's because the founder had a really strong personality and, and built a good business. It's just not, it's not going to last. And it's an empty kind of a thought. And then third, what are we going to accomplish together, right? My, my grandfather used to always say when I was played baseball, uh, well, he'd say, Dana, you get what you measure. And I, I didn't understand that. And he, I said, what, what do you mean? You get what you measure. You want to throw a faster fastball? And I say, sure. Well, how fast do you throw it now? I don't know. Well, start with that and then go from go forward, right? What's the goal? What are we measuring together? And if we measure it and set goals, we'll get more of it. We'll be able to accomplish more of it. But without a specific idea of what we're trying to accomplish, we're, we're just going to be, you know, flying that jet back to that analogy, just around in the sky with, with nowhere to go. And then finally, how are we going to do it? Who's going to do what? If I'm strong with sales and marketing, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be the CFO probably. If you're great with, with executive leadership, then we probably don't want you, you know, uh, running uh, the financial side. So who's going to do what and how are we going to do that? And I want to make a point here. Uh, Chris, you and I talked a little bit about it in prep for this, but, but there, you know, back to the jet analogy. If you can't fly the plane yourself, okay, let's, let's, let's go back to that. If brother and I own the jet and we can't fly the plane and we hire someone to fly the plane, it's so important that that pilot knows who we are, knows what's important to us, and knows where we're trying to go. If they, that pilot, and here you can see the analogy of executives and leaders in the business who have their own family scenarios that they're trying to support and work through and their own career goals. If they don't see that alignment in us as the owners, and if we can't define it, the good pilots are going to leave and they're going to go fly somebody else's plane or they're going to fly their own plane. And, and so it's so important to take the time and, and reach alignment on these questions and get them captured in our family constitutions. Uh, next, uh, next slide, let's, let's talk about some of the policies and agreements and kind of the areas, right? A constitution, as was brought up earlier, needs to represent your family. Uh, and so cutting and pasting or copying from other uh, folks' work and, and energy, on one hand, is I mean, it might be practical or it might be cost efficient or time efficient, but it's not going to last because it was not created from the heart and soul of the family that needs to rely on it. As we develop constitutions with families, we see that there's six main areas that policies kind of fit into. One is back to this question of what's our purpose here? What are we doing? What's the goal? A uh, second area is this question of what structures and entities exist in the governance part of this to help us accomplish those goals and to organize our en efforts and our energies. Procedures, you know, how do we, how do, what are the most common problems and how do we handle them and how do we make sense of them? And then the, the more specific nuanced policies and statements uh, that we'll get into here in a second with some examples. And then fifth, what are the perks and benefits of being a member of the family? What are the perks and benefits of being a member of the ownership group? What are the perks and benefits that come from working in the business? So that there's this focus also on gratitude for a system that yes, has created the need to manage problems, but also one that provides lots of benefits that sometimes we start to take for granted in our families. And then finally, what are the kind of business and operating companies that are a part of this that we're trying to bring alignment to? Chris, um, I would imagine uh, some of this resonates with you um, and that you might have something to add to it. Well, and just, you know, I think of those broad groups and within those, you know, there may be uh, 10 sub policies or 10 subcomponents to any one of those areas and it really depends on the family. Um, you know some families are going to lean more towards broad agreements that they're trying to reach whereas other families they, they really feel more safe if there's a lot of rule boundness and, and want to have um, you know what I'll call a little more uh, uh, 
uh, microscopic or, or a detail yeah. level on how decisions get made versus a, a different family might focus more on the broader principles that they seek to follow. And, um, and there's not a right and a wrong here. Um, there, there, there are rights and wrongs on some of these, some of the components, uh, but in terms of how the family chooses to create a constitution, that's going to vary from family to family. Yeah. Um, I like to talk about some of the sample policies and agreements that, uh, or the early policies and agreements that uh, would be very common for a family that's starting from scratch. And uh, you know, air, uh, the airplane analogy has been used twice now by by Dana and. Uh, you know, we know a lot of our uh, a lot of our listeners who are calling in today have airplanes, and I'm sure there's a lot of stories about, you know, who gets to use the plane and what happens if there's an overnight situation and what happens if the business needs it and a family shareholder is wanting to use it and all those kinds of issues and, you know, and what a great example of just how where a policy could really uh, help and and help anticipate conflict and help set the stage for how to work through uh, competing, uh, you know, the scarcity of resources being competed for by multiple constituencies. So, you know, that's a great example. But the kind of policies we often see uh, early on are, you know, a code of conduct that lays out for the family expected ways of treating each other, of treating communication, of uh, addressing each other in public and or private, um, really spelling out how the family intends to function and work together uh, as it relates to areas of interpersonal communication, uh, behaviors that are expected uh, by the family and, you know, not, not like demanded, uh, put down upon like you will do this, but where the family really comes together and says, if we all agreed to that, it would create a healthier family for us and a healthier ability to address business issues in a timely manner. Uh, so we like to see a code of conduct out there. Family employment policies and those of uh, uh, those on the call who've uh, been to other webinars know that this is a you know really an early stage uh, policy that would be very important uh, to to you know we saw the picture of the expanding family and in it, as you start getting into three siblings going to uh, 10 children, well, maybe all 10 children aren't going to work in the business, so how do we make sure that we get very well-qualified candidates who are ready and uh, to work and ready to, to work well for the benefit of the greater organization and have, you know, a fairness attached to that process about how they get jobs and how they move, in, move up into uh, the organization. So that's a, a good early stage uh, policy. Um, obviously, decision-making is a huge one. Uh, and decision making can be everything from how the family will make decisions when it's by itself and then also decision making between uh, the shareholder group and the board and the uh, management group and the family wherever those points come in contact with each other and what's the process for making decisions with those different factions. Um, we also like to see board membership criteria especially for family. It's a good early stage uh, policy and, and a great one to have in place before the kids are of age where they're coming onto the board or the cousins are coming onto the board. And then uh, a distribution policy. Uh, you know, the, being a, a shareholder in a multi-generational firm is probably meaning that there are a lot more people as owners than are, that are in the family than are uh, managers who are in the family. And so you know, even though in early stage businesses we see a lot of reinvestment to grow the business, as we get towards later stage cousin enterprises, you know, having some type of return, uh, immediate return in the form of distributions is a really important component of, of being an owner and feeling tied to the enterprise. And so what is the policy going to look like? Uh, a policy that won't, won't hurt the business and, and uh, will provide for business growth and, and the goals of the business, but also to share some of that with the shareholders in the form of a return on their investment. And then lastly, uh, a conflict resolution policy. Uh, you know, the, the families coming together with a goal of having a constitution that it brings some unity and alignment, but we gotta be real. There's gonna be conflict from time to time. And 
It comes at the most un unexpected times sometimes, uh, even with a constitution. And for a family to have clarity about, all right, if we start experiencing conflict, this is how we're going to address it. And, and, and maybe it's a two or a three or a four step process that that family comes up with that they can agree on and everybody you know, signs on to it that says, yes, I agree if we enter into conflict, we're going to use this approach and this policy to resolve it. And so a conflict resolution policy, you know, reasonably early on in the process can be a very healthy uh, addition to the family constitution. It also gives some guidance on what to do if conflict emerges during the creation of the constitution itself uh, because the family's already thought through, okay, here's how we're going to handle it. Yeah. Chris, could I interject? Yeah, please. Uh, so two, two points. So first of all, I, I would want to underscore how important the code of conduct is because keep in mind, again, we, we start out in, in, in these systems in our families and our families are emotionally based organizations and they should be and they're filled with love and, 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 uh, and loyalty, but they also are filled with frustration and conflict because of the closeness. So being able early on to say, how are we going to communicate with each other? How are we going to make sure that we're listening to each other, that we're trying to understand each other, and that we're not jumping into historical patterns of, of interruptions or outbursts? It's just so very important. And then a, a practical um, application of the distribution policy that I, that I saw happen with a client, uh, an international client that I thought I'd share was really interesting. So it was a second generation family. Father had passed away, had been really successful, had bought a lot of real estate, also had great operating companies, lodging, uh, entertainment related companies. Um, and in this sibling group, the second generation, uh, there was there were different spending patterns. Let's put it that way, which is pretty common, right? Some people uh, use money differently than others. That's not a surprise. And and the the family business leader in the second generation was trying to uh, create new loans with banks that would help them leverage land that the father had create had bought in order to develop more property and to develop more business and to grow as the family grew. But the banks in the community knew a lot about the family and they were worried about spending patterns. They were worried about the alignment of the, of the shareholders. So we created a distribution policy that was really clear about a maximum amount of net income that would, would be used for distribution. And, and after that was finished, and as we got very close to finishing the, the whole constitution, which in this country would become law once it was signed, it would become legally and binding for the family, the family was able to take the document to a banker who saw the value in it, made the loan, and it really helped this family kind of get into another mode of, of growth and development in a second generation. So it was a really practical help to them all along, all around. Great. And, and I'm, I'm going to loop back as you were, you were identifying that when I was thinking about the code of conduct and really a practical example of how that has benefited. Um, I worked with a, a family where they had a, just really difficult conversations between the generations. And you know what they found was the the siblings would be, you know, going to various parents and you know one sibling goes to one parent and one sibling goes to the next parent and and it was tearing down the trust between the family members and just they agreed that when siblings talk with each other they don't share the content of the uh, of the discussion they can they could share outcomes if they if they want to if, you know agreements made or something like that but they weren't going to share the content and the trust in the sibling group grew and interestingly, the trust between the parents and the siblings grew. The parents started having more confidence in their kids because they saw the, the group getting together. And it was really all just because they had agreed on a, a, a forum and, and format for how they would treat each other and, and deal with communication. So that, uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, sure. Next slide, if we could. Uh, as we think about just tips for making a constitution a success. So we've, you know, we're we're in this limited amount of time. We can't go through every single policy and, and why they're important and all the nuances of a given policy. But but we can think broadly about, you know, if we're really going to make this 
constitution uh, a, a, a success, what do we need to do to make sure it, 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 it finishes and that gets implemented ultimately? So you know, we like to think of SMART goals. The SMART goals are a specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound uh, as we set goals for accomplishing the Constitution. And if there's going to be a Constitution that has you know, 45 policies in it, uh, don't be thinking you're going to get that done in a weekend retreat. Uh, this is going to be a process that takes time. Uh, we like to see roles defined and responsibilities clarified. Uh, for example, a really large family, there's no way they can get everybody in the room and work through each and every component of the Constitution. And while they might have everybody in discussions, you know, giving input and, and uh, hearing each other on some of the, the critical mission, vision, values, high-level things, uh, with the other policies, it's just too many people to try to wordsmith. And so there's probably going to be a working group. So if there's a working group, what authorities and responsibilities does it have? Uh, how is it to communicate back with the larger group? How can we make sure that the working group doesn't get too far ahead of the broader family? We need to have roles and responsibilities very clear about who's doing what and by when, and then people know what to expect, and that increases trust in the system, especially when you're working with a broader group that's, that's a sizable. Um, the other thing is building a cadence. Um, I, I think that a, a kind of a stable, you know, we're going to meet, we're going to uh, synthesize, we're going to create a product, we're going to bring it back to the main group, and then we're going to meet again, and we're going to do uh, repeat that over and over. And just doing that on a, on a stable basis really can help. So whether that's, you know, we're going to meet once a month or once every uh, two months, uh, just having some clarity about how that will take place and so the family can feel good about making progress along the way. Uh, sometimes creating policy can be really tedious and frustrating and if there's a, a, a concerted effort to make sure it keeps moving forward, that's very helpful for the family to feel like it's a worthwhile exercise and, and can feel like they can start implementing some of the components. Um, I also like to think of the Constitution as the beginning and not the end of the process. And, uh, you know, for some folks, they might be thinking, no, we need this document and it's going to hold us together and spell everything out. Well, the document's great, but people need to understand it and they need to understand the nuances and they need to experience how that document is guiding the organization and or the family. And uh, the implementation process really needs uh, the same amount of respect and thought as the creation of the document itself. So getting together and ratifying the document is is really the beginning. If you kind of think about it like a, a marriage, you know, there's a courtship and everything and there's a wedding date and that sort of ratification date, but then you got to make it work a, along the way. And so that's really the, the way we think about that is to uh, have a plan for implementing it and revisit it and refresh it in the minds of the people that are that have signed off on it. And then just lastly, um, constitutions, it, in, in creating a constitution, uh, we want to avoid becoming so rigid in thinking that we can't come to any alignment. And impliability really is an important component of that. Being able to hear others and hear others' perspectives and being being willing to forge an agreement on how to move forward, even though maybe it doesn't meet 100% of our needs, uh, but it, it but it's but it's acceptable and it's something we're willing to live by, uh, as opposed to becoming so rigid that it's either got to be my way or the highway. Um, you know, again, that can work for a generation, but uh, especially when the senior generation is uh, speaking that way or thinking that way, but it's probably not going to be lasting to a group of cousins. There needs to be buy-in and there needs to be some of that flexibility. And, and related to pliability, uh, the Constitution itself, we don't want it to become so brittle that it just breaks apart. And so having a refreshment and renewal process built into the Constitution, you know, we're going we're gonna to check in once a year and see what, you know, see what needs to be uh, modified or we're going to review it in totality and five years down the road uh, so that we know that 
you know, yes, it's it's guiding us, but we're going to make sure it stays fresh in the life of the family. And those are really important components of making sure the Constitution succeeds over time. So that's all I have. Uh, Dana, any final thoughts before we go to questions and answers? No, I just think that, uh, again, the, the ability to change that Constitution Constitution should be built into it much like we've changed and amended the Constitution of the United States right over the last 240 years so times change families grow businesses change and it, it is really crucial that there's that inclusive ability to change based on the needs of the system great thank you perfect thank you Dana thank you Chris for your thoughts and sharing some great uh, sort of baseline and um, you know, informed by your experience, it's a, a viewpoint of constitutions that we could use for this discussion. We're going to go to questions. Um, I'm going to give everybody a minute to type in any additional questions that they would like to share. So in each of your interfaces, there is a, a space for that. Feel free to type in comments, questions, things that you'd like to learn more about. Uh, and we've got a few minutes left to talk about them. Before we go into those, uh, I wanted to remind everyone that you will receive some information after this program. So we've had some questions about, will, will we receive slides? Yes, you'll receive slides. You'll receive access to a recording of this program. Those will all come to you by email in the coming days. Days, so please stay tuned for that. In addition, there's a document included in that that provides an overview of some of the common sections and policies and uh, information that is included in family constitutions. So that's a good little reference guide if you're looking for more ideas of the kinds of directions that a family constitution can go. Um, we also wanted to share a couple of additional resources. Um, we have an, a, another webinar coming up in December on the differences between advisory and fiduciary boards for those of you who are interested in board governance topics. Um, and we also have recently uh, opened an event in April of 2018 called the Chair Forum, uh, which we've been doing for the last few years for family business board chairs. Uh, in addition, there's an article library on our website with additional topics you can search. Uh, in the top corner for pretty much any uh, topic related to family business and find some additional information for free. Uh, and the books in the bottom corner, uh, in including a book on the family constitution, may be additional resources if you're interested in learning more about the topic. So with that, we'll go to Q&A. And uh, one of the things that we got a lot of questions about is timing. So uh, Harry mentioned that he appreciated the comment about it may take a couple of years to complete. And then a couple other people chimed in and said, you know, so what exactly are we looking at in terms of time? So I, I think we've alluded to this being something that requires some commitment. And I, I think there's both time and energy commitment, but also a longer process. So maybe can you give us a better idea of what you see with families on how this evolves over time and what people can expect? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in and just say, you know, the last, let's say if I look at the last 10 engagements that I've had where the family constitution was the main objective, that to get those done well with all of the principles of inclusion, uh, it took 18 to 24 months to do it well. Uh, and a lot of that is simply because families are large and dispersed and busy. But a bigger part of it, too, is we try to build in uh, a conscious, uh, you know, time frame so that people can think and, and, and think carefully about what they're putting into it so that it's not a hurry up and, and get it done, but maybe make a bad decision or make something that doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I'll say that another way. You don't die on the timeline. Uh, you set the timeline, and, and I agree with the timing uh, Dana talked about for a more formal process. If the family is going to adopt more of a one-off informal process, it could take five to ten years to get everything in place. And uh, you know, but for what we've been talking about really throughout this program is a more formal, structured process, 18 to 24 months. But something may happen in the family and or the business that requires a pause in the process. And so that should be built into the process on the front end is the mechanism for how we're going to uh, spread things out if they need to for the health of the, and well-being of the, either the family or the business. Perfect. Uh, the next question that I have here is around alternatives to a family constitution. So we've, we're talking about the constitution today. It's a, a, a tool or a process. Um, what are other ways that families think about achieving some of the similar goals, and maybe why would they choose a family constitution versus an alternative? 
Chris, you want to take? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm just thinking why why a constitution? I I think the family constitution is when the family has gotten to a point of saying uh, we really want to focus on multi generational continuity and having clarity amongst all members of all generations of how this is all going to work together. Um, you know, if you think about alternatives, uh, almost every company would have a shareholders agreement that would define here's how the stock passes and here's who can own it and here's how the board gets voted on and those kinds of things. So I guess you could call that an alternative, but that really, that only addresses the legal the stock component. It doesn't really address the mission, vision, values, and 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 ultimately, you know, questions like how big the board should be and why, and how do family members prepare for the board, and why should family members be on the board, and you know, getting into more of the heart of the matter. Um, so, you know, I would see shareholders agreements. I know we hear from some of our and Dana has got more experience working overseas with. Uh, I don't know if you've bounced into protocols and um, you know other other types of agreements like that, Dana. But uh, uh, you know that would be the, those would be maybe more common, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, from my experience, which yeah. is somewhat limited. Yeah, I think I mean one alternative is just to do nothing uh, and and hope for you know a better result. Um, I think so much of it just depends, as you said earlier on, Chris, on where where the family is. I mean, I work with some families who have billion-dollar businesses and don't have a budgeting function. And when they realize that they need a budgeting function, they can't, you know, go from zero to 100 miles an hour in the budgeting function in a short amount of time and, and produce something like, say, GE might. But they might start with identifying five policies or five agreements that they need to have that help them govern this the family's relationship with the business. Uh, so you know it might it and it and it might be that you know if one out of 20 family members feels strongly that a family constitution is is the answer and the others don't right then it's it's better to start with something uh, in terms of governance towards good continuity and good governance than than nothing. Which goes back to the informal process that. Yeah. Yeah. It leans you more in that direction if uh, if the family's not ready or maybe not able, maybe not capable of, of working on the broader uh, document. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next question I have is from Grant. In today's American culture, the individual is king. How do you get a family to discuss how an individual operates in a community? And does there need to be a discussion of overarching purpose? Ah, uh, so... Yeah. Individual is king, um, but how do we get individuals to operate? Well, you know, there is a, there is a truth here that we're talking about. When I say a constitution is most relevant, uh, relevant to the multi-generational family, that's acknowledging that there is an interest in having the broader family uh, stay connected and, and uh, subdue the self somewhat, not totally, but somewhat. Uh, in order to work for the common good of the whole. And if somebody is really interested in just being by themselves, they're probably not going to buy into a constitution and frankly they probably are going to go out on their own and, and separate from the family business. But I, but I throw an alternative in there. Um, there is nothing more powerful than when individuals with their own voice, with their own hearts, come together and com commit to something uh, in unison with the group and choose voluntarily to participate as a group uh, and, and, and find strength in the collective as well as their own individual strength. And so that's where I would see that, you know, that, that ability to choose to come in to enter the process, which by the way, uh, in the, the comment was specifically about the United States. Uh, we don't do well when people tell us, here's how you will choose. Uh, <laughs> family members don't like to be told, you will choose to be a, in partnership with your brother or your sister. No, that doesn't really work so well. Uh, there needs to be some type of freedom of choice to enter. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but that's where my thoughts went. 
And it's a really good question, and, and it's a very difficult one. Um, I was with clients yesterday, and it came up. There's a family that has um, six children, and in, in the discussion, the question was, well, what if some don't want to participate? And it's just one of the great kind of challenges, heartaches of family is that we, we, you know, I have kids, I want my kids to always get along with each other, always see eye to eye. But the reality is I don't always see eye to eye with my siblings and my parents haven't always seen eye to eye with their siblings. We don't always have the same goals. We don't always have alignment. And so being able to create, as, as this question gets to, a system where the benefits of working together uh, outweigh the the benefits of individual you know striving to accomplish something you know creating that that benefit that mutual benefit is the goal but also building into it and this is a policy that we write a lot of times in constitutions what if someone chooses to not be an owner mm -hmm. right that that should be an acceptable reasonable question that's not quickly you know, determined to be heresy from the founder or from other members of the family. I'm, you know, specific example, I work with a family where one of the sons said, I want to be a veterinarian. I've always loved animals. I want to take care of them. It's my passion. It's why would I be involved in the, you know, in the family business? And it was reasonable enough. And the, and the founder and the kids in the second generation were reasonable enough to say, okay, let's, let's give you an exit from the ownership group. We're not kicking you out of the family. You're not saying you went out of the family. And we'll do it in a way that's respectful. And it worked out really well. And he's a great vet, actually. Uh, a great vet. And yeah. there's actually there are actually a couple of questions in the queue about that specifically, too, as to whether there is a place in the Constitution for an exit policy for those who don't want to participate. So is that something that you place in the Constitution specifically? Yeah, you'd, you'd, want, your, you'd want the Constitution to address that. But it could be addressed at a couple different levels. Um, life is is ever changing, and we go through time periods in our lives as human beings where uh, we need to isolate, maybe for some reason, and uh, it's just a it's a tough tough situation we're experiencing. And a healthy constitution is going to actually give clarity to what happens if someone maybe they don't want to sell their ownership, but they just they want to step aside from all the governance pieces in the family meeting process. They need to step away for whatever reason, and to have a constitution that addresses that is actually very helpful and strength building to the family so that when somebody does step aside, instead of feelings of rejection and, and, and the family feels like, hey, we need to you know, isolate this person as the bad person who walked away and you know, uh, you know, moved away from us, there's a, a little more gracious approach to it and, and the family sees that as an opportunity for that person for whatever reason they may have to go and and uh, you know decide whether they want to exit permanently or come back into the fold and uh, we've seen lots of families where people uh, in fact I think it's actually pretty common in a large family to have individuals that will step out for a while from the process or step out step away from just having to deal with it all uh, but not relinquish their ownership uh, but yes there does need to be an exit uh, approach for owners that want to exit as well Perfect. Yeah, I, would, I would say. Go ahead, Dana. Uh, I mean, when people are forced to be owners and they're and they're not given an opportunity to get out, they're going to create chaos. It's like the it's like the only power of the powerless, right? Is to create chaos and to create conflict. And so, there's a very practical um, question, which is, why would I want to constrain people that I love and care about? into a system that they don't want to be a part of and that they don't choose. I think it's a really, really important part of a constitution. Great. Okay, we're going to take one more question and then I would encourage everybody who's participated today to please um, complete the survey after the program. It's really helpful to us in designing future programs. Um, the last question I'm going to take today is, uh, we talked a little bit about earlier about inclusion. So what are some important considerations when determining if and who of the next generation should be included in these sort of big picture conversations like governance and developing a family constitution? Oh, that's a good question. Well, wow, that's a it's a complicated one. I think I think inclusion um, can be more further defined as who is included in 
you know, the development of an idea, who is in, who has the right to be a part of the decision around that idea, who is included in the communication of that decision, right? Uh, and I, I think, I think inclusion in, in my experience trumps exclusion uh, almost in every case, right? And, and when I mean that, I mean having people included in the development of an idea, uh, even if they're because of age or, or ownership, not the right and appropriate person to decide about an idea, including people in the development of an idea and a process and giving them a voice far, far exceeds, you know, any benefit that comes from excluding people and, and keeping something, you know, uh, shorter. And, you know, there's a natural question, what about in-laws? You know, that always comes up. Uh, again, I, I, I believe strongly in the, the idea of including people appropriately and defining what appropriately really is in their own scenario. And I, and I would echo that, uh, Christy. I think... You know, I think we lean towards inclusion. There should be a very explicit reason, and it should be extraordinarily compelling if we're going to exclude people that we're going to ask to sign on and support the Constitution. I mean, you just think about it. You know, simple things like family employment. Uh, you know, a group of siblings can get together and lay out the family employment policy, but when their upset child goes to mom and you know, or dad, who's the in-law, and says, look, I was mistreated or I wasn't given the opportunity like my cousin was, uh, the, the, the spouses are part of that dialogue at that point. So why, why wouldn't we want to include them on the front end? Uh, there are exceptions to, to anything, I think, but uh, we'd like to lean towards that inclusion because we want them, we want all family members who are signing on to the Constitution to help carry it forward and, and bring up the next generation and welcome them into the Constitution at the appropriate age and time. Thank you, and uh, this is my opportunity to thank everyone for participating today. Uh, we are so glad that you joined us and stuck through to the end of the program to participate in the Q&A and, and get some additional insights from Dana and Chris. Dana, Chris, thank you for being our uh, experts today on the topic of family constitutions. Thank you, and thanks everybody for uh, for joining on this topic. It's a really, uh, really interesting topic for the field and for so many family enterprises out there. Perfect. Yes. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to all of you, and uh, have a good day. We hope we'll see you at a future program.